you. I'm involved in digital humanities and the intersection between computing science and humanities. And I work on a variety of projects, including ancient documents and archaeology, and trying to embed computing into people's systems. And we were asked <coughs> we were asked to join a project at Silchester, which is a dig connected to the University of Reading Archaeology Department. How did this come about? The JISC, the Joint Information Systems Committee, a government funding agency, decided that they were going to fund some things in the virtual research environments. What's a virtual research environment? Nobody really knows, but they're giving out big grants of like 250, 300k for people to build them and play with them. And part of the bid was that you had to have people who were interested in user studies on board. So people could build them, but you had to study how they were used. So we were approached by Reading, who were putting in this bid based around Silchester and the work they were doing there in the relation with my brains and the internet uh, integrated archaeological database to see how much kit we could drag onto the field and see how much technology we could embed into the archaeological process to speed up <coughs> data entry, data acquisition, make things more available quickly. And we were going to study how this worked, if it worked. Now I have to take you back when I'm talking about this, back into time. The bid was called was in 2006, the project started in 2007. So let's just pause for a minute and think there were no iPhones then. iPhones were launched in 2007 and came to the UK in 2008, so we had none of that. There was no iPads, they didn't come to 2010. There was no real 3G Wi-Fi. If we were putting Wi-Fi across a dig, we had to do it ourselves and that was costly. I mean, there still isn't Wi-Fi across most rural digs in the middle of nowhere, right? So you're going to have to provide things yourself. So we were looking at the kit that was available then over a three year period, taking it into the dig, seeing what we could do. So this is a different type of engagement to what you've been talking about previously. We're not talking about just telling other people what we're doing on, we're talking about embedding technology with an archaeological practice, seeing if we can speed up data gathering and therefore also what we can do with the data at the end. So this is the spiel about what we said we were going to do. We're going to produce a fully-fledged virtual research environment for the archaeological community. We're going to assess, enhance and introduce new tools and technologies. And our goal is to create a situation where the information flows seamlessly from excavation through post-excavation to archive and publication. Woo! This is the kind of things you write on grant applications. What it actually meant is we're buying lots of kit, we're taking it in the trench, we're seeing what works, we're seeing what breaks, we're seeing what gets rained on, we're seeing what gets muddy. We're going to see what we can do to speed up the recording of archaeological processes whilst working closely with archaeologists so we don't anger them and we're not asking them to change the practices. We're trying to embed technology to their practices rather than being those awful computing scientists which walk up and go, you don't want to do it like that, you want to do it like this, because that's never going to work. We don't want to assume that we know more than archaeologists do about how, why they do things. So here's Silchester, it's quite near Reading. Um, uh, the dig has been going on for, what, the past 20 years? More, around about. Um, every year there's a training dig, the students from the archaeology department go and they dig more and more and more over one insula in the town of Silchester, uh, the Roman town. Um, and they're studying archaeological change and urban data. Uh, if you want to find more about Silchester, they have a dedicated website just to that dig itself. Our project was called Vera, Virtual Environments for Research and Archaeology. Here's a nice website, checked this yesterday, completely fallen over. I don't know who in Reading to call on the back phone to actually say, so you have to look it up on the Internet Archive at the moment, but I'll try and get that fixed. So we worked with the Silchester dig 2008-2009 and uh, also a little bit in 2010 and we were studying the use of IT in an archaeological context, investigating the tasks and um, we had a researcher, Claire Fisher, who's here today, actually on site, who is a trained archaeologist, working with us to study what worked and what didn't as we took tools onto the train. Um, Silchester is fascinating, has a record of Roman urban development and they've been gradually digging through the different periods of Roman archaeology. They have been using the internet integrated sorry, archaeological database for a few number of years before we came along and tried to help them with this. So they have a system where they're collecting you know, context sheets and over the winter people are typing this stuff into the computer. What could we do to speed this up? So the IEDB was a key component, it had already been used at Silchester and the people who were working in engineering at Reading were then going to take this, put it on the Reading servers, make sure the code was put into a slightly different format which could be integrated into different systems and host it at Reading so there was some funding there and it's after the, the, the 
project is finished, it's, the IDB still works from the Reading servers, even though the project is ended. So Reading University promised to look after the IDB, which is used by various archaeological digs. Um, and we took as much kit as we could onto the dig to test it. So we didn't have any iPads, we didn't have any iPhones, we had uh, handheld iPads, ruggedized tablet PCs, so these are the precursors of the stuff that we were also familiar now. And things have changed so much over the past three or four years, if we were doing it now, we would probably do it completely differently. Um, we took ruggedized things on, we took um, Digimemo pads, which broke every two minutes as soon as we saw dust or rain. We tried wireless webcams, but there was ethics involved. We wanted to track where people were going across the course of a day, and we were, but um, the ethics committee didn't want us to put numbers on people's backs and like, trace them through time. You know, you can see why that's going to be a bit of an issue. We, um, we used digital pens to see whether or not we could actually speed up data entry on forms. We joked about how we should have put sombreros on the bed because most of the screens you couldn't look at in sunlight. So if we had to put on the bed that we could afford to buy some we might have actually been able to see the digital tech. We also had problems with rain. It rained a lot and there was quite a lot of flooding on site and obviously put in kit in the trench when you know thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds worth of electronic kit not going to work so well in the mud. Um, we also had a problem with power, all this stuff needs power, you have to have your generator, the generator wasn't big enough, we couldn't afford another one. We also had a problem with people unplugging the power, um, particularly to do with the wireless. We had an agreement with the farmer in the, who owned the land and the next land, and, and the wireless router was plugged in in his barn about half a mile away, but his staff didn't really know what this thing was that was plugged in, and every now and then they'd go, what's that, and just switch off, all the wireless network were dead. We'd have to send someone to the farm to go, someone pulled out the plug again. Yes, it happened like twice a day. So, um, it, you know, there are issues when you're trying to build technological infrastructure about basic things, the environment and also electricity and Wi-Fi, when you're trying to integrate that into our political process. The other thing is money. We had about 250k, I think, maybe close to 3,000k for this project. It's a lot of money, right? And it was great, and it was from this scheme, there was various other things funded in the scheme, but actually, the amount of money we spent on kit and the amount of money we spent on people, I'm not sure represented good value for money for the archaeological community, that's one thing. And the second thing is, how strapped for cash is archaeology just now? What else could have you have done with all of that money, rather than us going, woohoo, we'll take some iPads or next best thing into the trench and see if they break, you know? So I have a bit of a problem with, the type of thing that was parachuted in, into to the, um, the study itself. Some of the things we found were we used digital pens. These work like normal pens. They have, you work with a special paper and it records what you actually write. So we thought we'd try to do this for context sheets. And instead of people writing on a normal content sheet, they write on a digital paper, we can then take it immediately into the computer, it then uses character recognition and fills up the database fields automatically, pretty much, so that when people are filling out the context cards, they just have to take the pens back into the hub and upload them, and we don't have this data entry problem at the end of the dig. So it's saving months of time, but it's also making information available pretty much daily. So that worked quite well, and the drawings worked as well, so people could make sketches and these go straight into the computer. Um, by 2009, 44% of the context cards in the digs were being used by these digital pens. They were really quite simple to use. We couldn't afford to print out context cards on this digital paper because it was too expensive. So we had to train people how to do them slightly differently than the context sheets they'd been using before. So there is a cost implication to using these. Yes, they're only about £30 to buy, but if you wanted to print off the paper in the way that the forms had previously worked, it was going to cost about £10,000, and we just didn't have that to print off enough paper so we could use. So we found that it did speed up the post-excavation work. It also, we like this, encourages legible handwriting. So we could actually, you had to write legibly so the computer could understand it. So, and we had a paper record as well that we could still file. So that worked quite well. Things that didn't work, the Digimemo pad kept breaking. We bought four and five and they all broke within like an hour. Um, we tried GPS. The staff needed training, quite a lot of training to get a hang of that and to understand how to use it, but that did speed up recording, spatial recording. We found that 
we really needed to train people to use all this stuff. So it was important to have Claire on site to be helping. We also had an, um, another RA who was helping train and helping try to encourage people to use this because there were people who didn't want things to change. They liked to be on an archaeological dig. They didn't want Wi-Fi. They did. They wanted to be away from their email, away from the internet. They didn't want. They didn't understand what we were forcing them to do. It. So there was a tension there between trying to encourage people to use it and speeding up things and not treading on people's toes. Um, I love this. this. This was a picture from the site which actually kind of went viral online at the time. Um, there were some tensions, right, between people. And I think when you do bring engineers and digital human humanists and archaeologists together and try and kind of shoehorn them in the project and everyone's going to love each other, it's all going to be fine. There were tensions and I think that's fair to say that trying to engage and... Yeah, they're laughing. <laughs> um, <laughs> there were tensions between people and, and the systems, getting the systems people at Reading to understand their needs when we were trying to work with a database and trying to encourage people to use technology that they don't. So there, there is an issue there when you're bringing technology in, uh, trying to technologize a system. There is an issue there about how you treat people. We did our best. We tried to engage with people. We tried to encourage people to use it. But there's always going to be different opinions at work and, and different um, methods that people have developed how to deal with information. And it's very difficult to change people's systems overnight. Over a period of two or three years, we did see things that, that, that did to change. And that was really nice that we could go back year after year after year and encourage the use of IT on site. So what were the conclusions from this? We concluded that the use of various digital devices did speed up the process of inserting excavation data into a database. It used to take three or four months, but now it was during the dig. So that's a different type of digital engagement, right? That means that the experts can get the information immediately. And also there was experimenting with calling up experts on Skype and things as soon as things were found on the dig to get their opinion about it, to make sure that the archaeological community could see information they are not having to wait months or years to see things. So it's a different type of digital engagement. Um, we did find a lot of training was necessary to use this stuff and to embed this stuff. There were some set of tips. Wi-Fi was liked by all the students. They loved to have one Wi-Fi over the site. I'm sure, I've not been back to Silchester um, in the past couple of years. I went off on maternity leave and had twins instead. But, um, I haven't been back, but I'm sure now they're all on their iPhones and checking their Twitter stream and stuff, and, and loving that in this really rural area there's this infrastructure, this te technological infrastructure while they're there for weeks over the summer. But this project was slightly too early. The technology <coughs> wasn't quite there yet. It was a really great idea, but the technology we were taking on site was expensive and it wasn't rugged enough, and we were just that step ahead of things that were coming out that were very more affordable that you could actually take them and also that people knew how to use. We were teaching people how to use tablets four years before the iPad came out and you're like, oh, what's this, you know? Now it, people already are aware of what they are and how they work. So um, it, it, would be a, it would be a different project now if we did it. And we have to acknowledge this rapid change in technology. We're talking about digital engagement. But the digital is not static and changes year upon year upon year, month upon month upon month. The types of social networks people are using, the types of tools, the infrastructure, but also the expectations from people are changing so rapidly. And it was really interesting for me to sit down and think, wow, actually, how much have things changed since this project wrapped up in 2010? You know? It's a, it's a lifetime change of, of technology. So we have to understand that when we're embedding tech into traditional fields that have long established methods, we also have to understand that when we're trying to do things, if you're sitting on a project now for digital engagement, it's not going to be the same in a year's time. You're going to have to keep rolling with punches and changing what you're doing and adapting to this really strong and fast digital environment. There are also issues of cost, I think, with this project. If you're wanting to embed IT into archaeological data, it's expensive. It's expensive for people if you're going to have to train lots of people, but it's also expensive to buy the kit. And I'm not sure that most archaeological data can support this level of funding that's needed to actually bring that on. We did understand the use of IT on site, and we have published a few nice papers about how to integrate IT into traditional archaeological systems. Um, and I can circulate these later if, if you like, if anyone wants to, wants to get them from me. But at the time, we weren't using much social media. This wasn't a big thing. We had a blog. Ooh, that was big in 2006, having a blog. There was no Twitter. There was, you know, there was no... Well, Facebook just started, but really there was no that type of engagement, that type of bit-by-bit bit engagement. It was like, yeah, we set up a blog and that was nice. Such a 
is still ongoing. And since they've the project wrapped up, they do use Twitter, they do use their blog more, they do have much more regular contact on social media and are doing that type of digital engagement. I'm not sure if, does the IDV do still have to have a password to get in to look at the data or is that publicly available now? It's publicly available at various okay. levels, yeah, through the still test publication. Ah, okay. Because previously you could, you could, you have to have a, uh, so that's an interesting switch then when you're talking about engagement and engagement with actual data, you don't have to be a member of the team, a member of the project, or an expert who emails in and go, please, can I see your project database? But you can come and actually see the, the underlying information. So that's an interesting to say. Um, the IDB has continued to go from strength to strength. It's, it's still sitting on the Reading servers, but, and Mike can answer more questions about this than I can, now has mobile capabilities. I was interested to see when it's on, on the website. So people, it is adapted to smartphones. Uh, the DIG continues with experimental techniques. They've been doing some interesting <coughs> aerial photography this year. They're using handsets for site tours. So they're still interested in what can technology do for their DIG and, and how can we change these things as we go on. And they have a really interesting blog there. I should say, of course, that um, this isn't just me who did this. This was a really large team of people who worked on this project. We had Mark Baker from Engineering, he led the project at Reading. I don't know if anyone in the audience knows Mark, and this is something I'm, I don't, I hope I don't have to say very often in my academic career. Um, Mark was very, very sick for a while, and unfortunately he passed away last week. Um, and I am indebted to him for, this is one of his presentations, which I've taken on. Mark really led the project and encouraged us all to kind of take as much time onto the site as possible. And he worked very well with Mike Fulford, who's the head of the Silchester dig and, and the archaeology there. So it was an interesting mix between engineers and archaeologists, and then us from UCL who know a bit about user studies. So that was good. We had a few research assistants as well working on this. So it was a, a really time-intensive project to do all this kind of thing. Um, it was really interesting for me to work on, and it was very interesting for me to see how we could kind of take technology outside and do some things with it. But I hope I've given you a flavour here of the different types of engagement that it can be. It's not just about telling people what you do, but it's about speeding up the process of getting information in and allowing people to see that information as, as quickly as possible to aid them in their research. So digital engagement can also be with researchers for their research as opposed to just a general, this is what we do. Thank you very much.